My name is Major Mike Webb. That is both my legal name and also the rank that I had attained after two decades of service in the U.S. Army, Army Reserve, and National Guards. A rank that only 50% of those who are commissioned attain. And according to the Arlington County Elections Board website, I am an independent candidate for state delegate in Virginia's 3rd House District. But with my poll qualifications still pending for whatever reason to be the only opponent against Arlington Democrat Delegate Alfonso Lopez, who served as the House Majority Whip and who had been popularly elected representative for the 49th District since 2012, which was redesignated as 3rd District, December 28, 2021. And according to the Supreme Court, in a case decided in 1971, Monitor Patriot Company B. Roy, with regard to the First Amendment right to free speech, it can hardly be doubted that the constitutional guarantee has its fullest and most urgent application precisely to the conduct of campaigns for political office. While as observed in Doe v. Tanjapaho Parochial School Board, the loss of First Amendment freedoms for even minimal periods of time unquestionably constitutes irreparable injury. And under Buckley v. Vallejo, decided in 1976 by the Supreme Court, a candidate's expenditure of his personal funds directly facilitates his own political speech. And unlike my putative opponent, Delegate Lopez, mine is an entirely self-funded political campaign with no special interest control. Which is good because most people who, with whom I have dealt over the years will tell you that I like to tell it like it is. Holding nothing in reserve. And I even have one Army Officer evaluation report from my raider as a lieutenant in echelon above core strategic counterintelligence where under his comments regarding candor my raider who had served as an iron major in the pentagon wrote that uh, in the decent's office that mike uh, tells me the truth even when i don't want to hear it which is not exactly a career enhancing uh, statement on your oer so, under the umbrella of free speech, let's talk about the safe and effective vaccines, a topic about which not even the Arlington and Republican candidates are discussing in their campaigns. But, at least the Supreme Court has said that uh, due process is the process that is due, but it has also been said that due process is a right to be heard at a meaningful time and in a meaningful manner. So first let's provide some context for my remarks which is important to provide a foundation for the basis of what may be described as my opinions especially since I am neither a professional scientist nor a physician licensed or otherwise credentials that may hold some persuasive value for you and others and in one case decided by the Supreme Court in the beginning of the 20th century, that some may be familiar, involving the smallpox vaccine in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Justice Harlan had observed that the only competent evidence that could be presented to the court to prove these propositions was the testimony of experts giving their opinions, a prudent rule. We all should be familiar with what is often described as white lab coat bias. Nine out of nine out of ten doctors recommend this chewing gum, which is an example of what would constitute a logical fallacy of appeal to authority, where just like its antithesis and ad hominem argument, the persuasion of the hearer is based not upon cogent arguments but rather upon emotional qualities attached to the man delivering those arguments, not going to, as attorneys say, the fact of the matter. And according to the Data Institute at the University of San Francisco, 
many may be vulnerable to different illogical appeals because pandemics are historically associated with times of fear, confusion, and helplessness. Nonetheless, some credentialed authority remains somewhat pertinent, particularly in these matters, and federal courts under the Federal Rule of Evidence 702, describing the difference between a lay person's testimony, what they happen to think about vaccines, what they happen to think about masks, what they happen to think about the coronavirus. And an expert opinion, the rule states that a witness who is qualified as an expert by knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education may testify in the form of an opinion or otherwise if a help you with your critical thinking skills the expert scientific technical or other specialized knowledge people who have some as we say special skills will help the trier of fact to understand the evidence or to determine a fact and issue because judges often find that once in a lifetime pandemics are a first time uh, case of first impression for them too if you've been to law school you know that courts traditionally askew speculative damages and is a rule against speculation you may recall from a movie uh, attorney going into court claiming an objection because the testimony is speculative speculation that's what that means B the testimony is based on sufficient facts or data no generalities, specific facts or data. C, the testimony is the product of reliable principles and methods. You know, just like the scientific method before suddenly we had an evolving science. And D, the expert has reliably applied those principles and methods to the facts of the case. And when it comes to infectious biological agents, when it comes to scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge, I can not only submit that I had served as the most junior commissioned Army officer to have ever served as the operations officer for all Army Strategic Counterintelligence in the Continental United States, or CONUS, with a personnel security clearance as high as the president, but also that I had played a key staff role during the standing up of a capability known as the AFMIC, or Armed Forces Medical Intelligence Center, the precursor to the NMIC, or National Medical Intelligence Center, which ABC News had reported back in April 2020, had provided early warning regarding an emerging public health crisis in China by at least 2019. I gained that experience 30 years ago, so I went through your pandemic, at least in war game, three decades before you probably even heard of a coronavirus. Essentially, I am a former biological warfare planner, and for some as yet unknown reason, in 2016, without application, I was one of only three persons who had been offered a job by DIA in a top secret billet, designated as an expired mission for whatever reason, a job for which I had never applied. There's no evidence that I ever applied, according to DOD, which uh, seems to indicate that they were looking for someone with some very special skills as a uh, procurement analyst went around getting stuff a uh, matter on appeal currently to the MSBB and awaiting decisions since 2018 before our pandemic just to compel what should have been a mandatory whistleblower investigation back then kind of stopped because of the longest lack of a quorum in history at that Tribunal, where be DOD, and also on appeal to the United States Supreme Court currently, where Web B Department of the Army has been docketed for certiorari. Catch whatever significance you want to that. So I am not just anybody with some assorted thoughts on novel coronaviruses, mere criticisms and enigmatic allegations. And during a pandemic. I had personally had docketed a half dozen cases for certiorari to the United States Supreme Court regarding the government's response to the now terminated public health emergency. 
and somehow folks all the way out in Seattle, the uh, Progressive Voters Guide had heard that I was, at least generally, against the government response to the public health crisis. I am a schoolhouse trained tactical military intelligence analyst, trained at Port Huachuca, Arizona, Army Intelligence Center and, I, and school, and I have served in maneuver battalions and special operations, 75th Ranger Regiment, and uh, both the Virginia and New Jersey National Guards, and hence my experience is generally focused on the deployment of biological agents, or biological war, but there is considerable overlap in knowledge when it comes to ideology, treatments, mitigation, and prevention measures, and the like. And it was my hope never to have to delve into topics regarding vaccinality, hoping early to nip it in the bud, filing the very first case in the nation against the lockdowns, and also the mask. But in December 2020, that hope had become, as we say in strategic counterintelligence, overcome by events, or OBE. So let's venture a little beyond what is usually my comfort zone, beyond the forward edge of battle or FIBA for tacticians, and discuss the reportedly safe and effective vaccines. Beginning with a very recent study that has been highlighted by multimillionaire Stephen Kirsch, who had received his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from MIT a number two ranked national university of 143 colleges that even I had considered but decided not to apply uh, second only to Princeton in 1980 a very selective private college that only accepts just four percent of those who apply which is impressive in itself but again his scientific expertise associated with that particular credential thinking logically critically is not biology but rather electrical engineering and computer science. While I am a graduate of the most competitive private college in Virginia with a bachelor's in public policy, but who had also served as a biological warfare planner attempting to stand up a NORAD type capability three decades ago to prevent things like our last pandemic. And I personally brought so many cases into the courts that Merrick Garland, the U.S. Attorney General, has described me as a litigation hobbyist because I don't even have a law degree or a license to practice. While the president, specifically on this COVID-19 issue, has described me as passionate. Now, according to Steve Kirsch on May 23rd of this year on his Substack blog, referring to what he called the Cleveland Clinic study, it's now officially in the peer-reviewed science the more COVID vaccines you get, the more likely you are to get COVID. And Kate Yandel, a professional journalist with a bachelor's degree in biology and English from the prestigious Williams College, from where Congressman Don Beyer had graduated, uh, the number one national liberal arts college and university in the nation, and also she has received a master's in journalism from NYU, pretty good journalism school, who has been covering life sciences only since 2012, and who had joined factcheck.org only this year, uh, towards the end of our pandemic, as a staff editor for various oncology websites, not COVID-19, including OBR Oncology, Patient Power, and Cancer Today, and has yet taken issue with Kirsch, but her primary argument is that the Cleveland Clinic study, properly titled Effectiveness of the Coronavirus Disease 2019 Bivalent Vaccine by Nabin K. Shestra et al., you can find it online, published in June 2023 issue of Open Forum Infectious Diseases, probably find it on PubMed. Dot, uh, com.org was only an observational study. I want to be reading science in a pandemic. Uh, only an observational study, meaning the researchers looked back, as she explained, at data available on clinic, Cleveland Clinic staff members, rather than randomly assigning people to particular interventions. Very similar to a study that was done at Cornell University 
uh, regarding some infections that had occurred there, but that were not occurring off campus around the surrounding counties, which suggests that it has something to do with the place location and not uh, uh, a, an infectious disease, which he uh, correctly states, however, uh, only suggests coincidental correlation and does not establish causation. Two different terms. You know they both start with C and sound alike. Uh, which in courts, in, in a course of logic, would be described as a valid argument. But not for the fact that the journalist, Miss Yandel, presenting her argument, also conceded, buried down towards the end, where few interested in anything other than a gotcha during a lethal pandemic, probably would just gloss over, even if they got that far in the in their reading, a TLDR, that a May 18 statement from a World Health Organization advisory group on vaccine composition said there is evidence from laboratory work that prior exposures to COVID-19 or vaccines may in fact reduce certain immune cells response to new parts of a variant. Very much what Mr. Kirsch had said. However, based on observational epidemiological studies, which we were talking about, observational studies, the clinical impact remains unclear, the statement says. So here, even though the WHO has acknowledged some usage of observational studies that suggested a degraded efficacy, which is distinct from effectiveness, which we might get into a little bit later, but at least at this time, they are unwilling or unable, for whatever reason, to endorse that finding as their policy. A lot of give and take often occurs in making policy. So here, simply being an observational study is not fatal as an argument. Uh, not a stake in the vampire's heart or a slam dunk. Uh, not shutting anybody down. As some people have resorted to uh, as their terminology like they were watching a spectator sport in a pandemic. At least for someone examining the science critically and not just rooting for a particular team in a pandemic that has claimed more lives than Hitler in the Holocaust in half the time and during what has become empirically the longest respiratory tract infection pandemic in history if you've been keeping track of pandemics for a long time, uh, particularly uh, respiratory tract infection pandemics. But thinking critically, what has the journalist and former English major, a wordsmith turned professional journalist from Williams College, informed us about observational studies that may be important, some value, or significant in examining her argument against uh, Mr. Kirsch. Well, Ms. Yandel says that in this observational study, researchers looked back, looked back at data available on Cleveland Clinic staff members rather than randomly assigning individual people to particular interventions. No specifics. Very general. Kind of guessing and a metadata analysis using not inductive inferences from specific perhaps even challenge studies uh, specific instances of data uh, which is actually what Sherlock Holmes did it was not actually deductive reasoning that was kind of an inside joke for Sir Arthur Crown and Doyle but they were not subjecting vaccinated persons to close encounters with live wild viruses called challenge studies, but rather deductive analysis, uh, going from general observations to extrapolate some specific inferential rule, hoping, and only hoping, to be applicable to all, but at most only a coincidental correlation, like a reinforced notion that every time you rub the screen at the casino, you happen to win the jackpot therefore or ergo it must be science which may not align with empirical or clinical reality but it seems to work for you and if it keeps working you're going to be reinforced in that misperception this is why magicians make a lot of money and hopefully 
that little lesson in logic that some learn at elite private schools will be of some value for you and other important decisions in your life, your body and your choice. I hope so because my father paid a lot of money for me to obtain that particular lesson and I am giving it to you for free to use or discard. Teach a man to fish and he'll never go hungry, they say. Give a man a fish and he'll be back asking for more fish tomorrow. Okay, so now that we have some general context for these competing arguments between Miss Yandel and Miss Kirsch, let's take a look first at what the Cleveland Clinic had said in their statement that had been published before this study had been peer-reviewed, a statement that had been published as far back as August 16, 2021, not long before the Pfizer product had been approved by the FDA for private label marketing or licensing. And that is all that that approval stamp means. The government grants permission for a private company, pharmaceutical company, to sell their medical product. I used to do pharmaceutical company defense, so I had to kind of know that. And the president had said before that approval had been granted that it was his hope that if more people had just heard those words of approval by that government regulatory agency, they would find some assurance and they would be less inclined not to be administered what had been described even in the emergency use authorization declaration, the paperwork, uh, back on uh, March 27, 2020, as only a COVID-19 countermeasure, not a quote-unquote vaccine, developed specifically to address a significant threat to citizens residing abroad, which may or may not include yourself, as well as uh, for national security, defined in this instance as uniform members of the active duty military. And this significant threat language, particularly in this context, contained in the statute has some significance because it transforms any related information to COVID-19 into what is described as at least information that has a personnel security classification designation, classified information of secret under Executive Order 12958. We had a lot of uh, litigation about that particular issue. We can probably discuss that later. And these specifications for our folks who have specialized in government contracting uh, know that uh, any use of these countermeasures products based on this information developed under this EUA declaration outside those specific parameters would therefore hence conform to an unauthorized commitment under the Federal Acquisition Regulations or FAR. Something that you have to know if you had been offered a job as a procurement analyst at DIA and had those special skills like me and two other people, as in fact I was before what had become a pandemic emergency recently abruptly terminated. And you are perfectly free to assign whatever value to that information that you choose. I have no personal stake in your game. Who won the game? Your body and your choice, as they say. Many had heard, heard immunity. Escuchan, as they say in Spanish, but had been deafened to the sound of defense in Defense Production Act which, uh, like the EUA declaration, presents some very restricting usages for federal acquisition purposes when we start getting into the fine points of law and legality and whether or not people are held liable, uh, particularly under the PREP Act. But as we had said before, pandemics are historically associated with fear, confusion, and despair. And perhaps, you know, badass though you may be, in pandemic, fear had been a factor for you happens on the waterboard. Your chances of actually dying on the waterboard are very remote. You may wish that you were dead, but very remote. Uh, but you have that perception that you are going to die. Very real. Which would be a perfectly reasonable apprehension. Especially, you know, first time 
once a lifetime pandemic, particularly if you had fallen in what had early been described as the most vulnerable to this disease condition. Uh, as we should know, uh, and as Dr. Fauci has only recently claimed that uh, he had said all along, uh, those who are elderly, those who have uh, certain specified, specified uh, comorbidity factors. Uh, and we only have 18,000, less than 18,000 uh, persons under the age of 20 worldwide amongst almost 7 million uh, who had become fatalities to this uh, coronavirus. So, no, if you vaccinated your child, they probably were not going to die statistically. They may have been vulnerable, but generally, if it's only less than 18 thousand from seven million fatalities uh, not really you know a high probability but uh, this would uh, conform in a court of law using the legal uh, uh, language to the definition of one element of proof of what some should be familiar with at least from back when we were talking about impeachments uh, extortion i.e. a reasonable apprehension of death or grave bodily harm you thought you were going to die. You were under duress, and so you did such and such. That's uh, how that plays out in the law. We're told Rex Galileo, a, a man of science, for instance, had been asked by the young monk towards the um, conclusion of that uh, dramatic uh, work, which I actually had a chance to uh, perform it. Uh, playing uh, Barberini, uh, later uh, Pope Urban IV, uh, while in college. Uh, he says to the young monk uh, as to why he had not continued to resist after he had been brought before the Inquisition and had rather elected to recant, wimp out as it were, what he had known to be uh, his own empirical observation that he had personally made a whole telescope and rings around Saturn and he rather famously responded in this play they showed me the instruments meaning the instruments of his torture in Inquisition and I am old he understood the science very well very reasonable unless you particularly want to be a martyr or something like that live today to fight another day or whatever badass justification that might conform uh, for uh, your uh, particular situation and understanding but that is all we have time for right now and next time we shall delve a little further into the exact representations in the Cleveland Clinic study uh, upon which uh, Stephen Kirsch had relied along with uh, some additional information about the purportedly safe and effective vaccines that may or may not be useful for your edification and understanding of this rather complex issue that uh, apparently uh, still uh, continues to be a mystery to many scientists and even the intelligence community. If only to assist in your forming a more informed opinion, uh, which is always important, especially when faced with evolutionary pressures of a lethal pandemic or uh, responses there too. And as uh, was said in U.S. v. Burr uh, back in 1807, a criminal case brought for prosecution of treason against Aaron Burr. Uh, we who are seeking truth and not victory, whether right or wrong, have no reason to turn our eyes from any source of light which presents itself. And least of all from a source so high and so respectable as the decision of the Supreme Court of the United States. And this briefing is unclassified. Carry on. Honest. This message was approved.
by Major Mike Webb. Honest.